So yeah, we need we need stories, and then we need these ritual forms, because all of the arts originally were aimed at the divine. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's really interesting or agonizing when people talk about the music industry. <laughs> like music's not an industry, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, it, it wasn't part of the industrial revolution, and it shouldn't <laughs> be, you know. Music was a way to connect to, express, and sustain the relationship between the human and the divine. And that's why, you know, there's a great love songs, but next year there needs to be new love songs because it all has to be made anew. And that was the old idea that culture, just like nature, was re- renewing itself all the time and that people were part of the embodied experience of both the death and the renewal, the loss and the reawakening. Mm. And since we're in the end of an era, I think that's what's trying to become conscious. And I agree, it has to be embodied. And when, a, when something is embodied, when, when someone knows it at a bodily level, that's different than believing in it, mm-hmm. right? Because people say, do you believe in myths? Well, you don't have to believe in myths. <laughs> yeah. They're not asking you to believe right. them. They're asking you to enter them and walk around and see what you can learn inside. And you don't, you know, the, one of the definitions of myth is this, a series of lies that tells the truth. <laughs> yeah, so you know the truth. You know the you truth know, and you don't get lost in the forest of lies. Was there ever an Icarus that flew through close to the sun and the wax holding the winds on, ling, wings on melted? No, I don't think so. But does, do people Icarus-like fly too close to the sun, which nowadays means the bright stage lights? Yes, all the time. It's a lie that reveals the truth. And so the arts were all part of that way of knowing and a way of really bowing to the mystery of life. Mm. So for what is worth, what I've learned from myth, from myths of all different places, the underlying mystery that is mm, connected or somehow implied in almost all of them is the mystery of life, death, renewal, birth, death, rebirth. That's the mystery. We are in it. Mm. We are an expression of it individually. And I think we're trying to become a more conscious expression of it collectively that the collective rite of passage is learning to walk in that mystery with some grace and some respect and a greater capacity for imagination. I think that's what we're being pulled into. Oh, oh. Um, If people are hungry for stories and places to go, I remember reading Edith Hamilton's anthology, I think it's just called Mythology, you know, and I know, yeah. I know that you have a whole series of podcasts that tell stories. And, and so definitely, I encourage everybody listening, go check out uh, your podcast. It's Mosaic Voices, right, is the name of it? Is that? Living Myth. Living Myth. The free podcast is called Living Myth. Yeah. On, mo- on mosaicvoices.org, that's your, that's your website. Yeah, that's the website. Yeah. So definitely check that out. But do you have other recommendations for like anthologies of stories? You know, that was definitely a Greco-Roman focused uh, anthology. Yeah. And so what do you, where do you go to, or where do you point people? Just The last uh, chapter was, the last chapter is uh, Myths from Other Cultures. She just threw that in at the end. <laughs> That's the book I read on my 13th birthday. Uh-huh. That changed my life. Yeah. I, I was this, you know, forlorn kid growing up in New York City feeling like I wasn't misunderstood and I didn't have a place. And my aunt accidentally gave me that book. She thought it was a history book. (laughs) I read it that night and it was like, wait a minute. I found the other world. I found a language. I found a mystery and an understanding and I qualified. It didn't matter that I was 13. It didn't matter that the family was poor. It didn't matter. I was the smallest kid in my class. I was now by virtue of being awake that night I was invited into that world, wow. so I'll, I carry I have a copy of that book right nearby <laughs> in my library. Yeah, I have it behind me on the bookshelf. But um, there's many, many of them, and so it's it's tricky because so um, I may not be go- a good person for advice on that, but the way I tell stories, I'll read stories from all over. I was doing it this morning, and then I put them down. I walk away, 
And then I'm walking in a field or walking down a street and boom, one of the story come back and it just like hits me like mm -hmm. the wind coming. Mm -hmm. That story wants me to tell it. That's how I understand it. So the best stories are the stories that want you to learn them and know them and share them. And so where people find them, it's, it's complex. So there are collections. I was this morning looking at um, Native American myths and legends, mm -hmm. an amazing collection of uh, indigenous stories from around uh, what we call America, North America. Um, and then there's great Irish collections. And then there's amazing folk tales of Africa. It's just this big territory. Um, as far as understanding myths, um, Joseph Campbell's teacher wrote an amazing book, and I can't remember the title right now, but, but Joseph Campbell was studying art history, and he took a class with, and his name is escaping me, I can't believe it, it's probably on that bookshelf behind mm -hmm. me, uh, and, uh, and so, well, I, I can't recommend it because I can't think of the title. We can Google it, but, figure it out, um, put it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, it's almost there, it's close by. Anyway, I think uh, there's no per se collection that, that I think is the best way to go. Uh, you follow themes. Yeah, nowadays you can Google it and you, you put a theme in and it'll give you uh, references. And it's, it's like a field. It's like another realm in which we're invited to wander around and you'll suddenly find something. You didn't know you were looking for it, but darn, there's that story. And uh, so I really recommend stumbling into the stories because there's an old saying that it's not just that we're thirsty, but the fountain wants us to drink. Once we allow that we don't know and we kind of stumble in the darkness, we're likely to run into the story that we need. <laughs> the stories want to be found. Well said. And our hunger, our hunger is the vehicle. Well said. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, a lot of times we digest our stories through movies now. And we have to understand that the movies have a deep economic incentive. And, uh, and sometimes those stories can be important and revelatory and, and you can unpack them and you can feel the truth underneath them. And sometimes there's the, actually the story isn't pointing. It's a, it's a series of lies that isn't pointing to truth. It's actually pointing to another lie. You know, and these are the, this is what we have to also be mindful of or some other form of manipulation that, uh, that is difficult. So it is, you know, I feel personally called to go back and, and look at some of the old stories and not saying that there aren't beautiful new stories being told. And, and, but as we form the new stories to start back at the beginning and then, uh, and then build new stories from there and also be mindful yeah. of, all right, not every story is true. Not every myth. Not every myth is actually pointing to truth. Just as we're fallible, sometimes the arts can be fallible as well. And so to, to carry that, to carry that kind of barometer, like, do, do you feel it? What do you feel in your body? You know, can you feel the truth of it? Can you really feel it? Because there's a part of us that knows, and there's a part of us that remembers all the truth. And it has to resonate with that part and, and tickle our instrument in a way where it feels right. Yeah. And a myth is more like this water flowing. So the idea, if, you, if we go into it with the idea, I'm, I'm going to understand this, I'm going to interpret it and understand it, you know, the myth kind of goes like that. <laughs> don't come too close. It's got to be, it, 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 it's being in the presence of something that is a vehicle or a channel of the unseen, of the, of the divine ultimately. Like, one difference between myths and fairy tales or myths and folk tales is in myths, the gods and goddesses are there. That's one of the differences. It's not always the defining thing, but that's one of the differences. And, and in a way, you could say everyone's really looking for love and everybody's really looking for contact with the divine, mm -hmm. a connection mm -hmm. to the divine. And, and, and it's interesting, myth is that. You know, and you don't have to understand the story. Uh, I often describe a story as uh, mythological acupuncture. And a part of that story will stick you exactly where you need a needle. And if you accept that, like just a description of uh, a Persephone 
in a story or in an artwork and allow it to penetrate, then it begins giving knowledge and doing healing. Mm. And so it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, mysterious journey into a territory mostly forgotten, but nearby just the way the river of memory is nearby in the underworld. Well, thank you for being a river of memory, a living river of memory for all of us and uh, for all the work you do. It's been uh, such a pleasure to be able to drop in here with you.